Hey, welcome back. Steve here. And today I'm talking with Jimmy Casas. Jimmy Casas has been an educator for over 30 years. He was the Iowa Secondary Principal of the Year in 2012 and a runner-up for the 2013 NASSP National Secondary Principal of the Year. Oh, man, he's an amazing author, speaker, coach, and leader. Today we're talking about his recent book, Recalibrate the Culture, Our Work, Our Why, Our Values. What an awesome book. What an awesome talk. You're going to love it. And thanks so much for listening. And it'd be so cool if you went to my website, stephenmaletto.com slash reviews and left a review and uh, and said some nice things and maybe give us, uh, what do you think? Give me five stars. <laughs> Could you do that for me? Uh, you're going to love this today. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening. Thanks for sharing and enjoy the show. It's the education podcast, your favorite show with lots of groovy guests and they share what they know. So crank it up the tin and let your neighbors know that here's another show with Dr. Steve Milletto. Teaching, learning, leading K-12. Teaching, learning, leading K-12. Teaching, learning, leading K-12. Ah. With Dot Steve Maletto. Jimmy Casas has been an educator for over 30 years, serving 22 years as a school leader, including 14 years as principal at Bettendorf High School. Under his leadership, Bettendorf was named one of the best high schools in the country three times by Newsweek and U.S. News and World Report. Jimmy was named the 2012 Iowa Secondary Principal of the Year and was selected as runner-up NASSP 2013 National Secondary Principal of the Year. In 2014, Jimmy was invited to the White House to speak on the Future Ready Schools Pledge. Jimmy is also the author of nine books, including the best-selling books, Culturize Every Student Every Day, Whatever It Takes, Live Your Excellence, Bring Your Best Self to School Every Day, and Handle with Care, Managing Difficult Situations in Schools with Dignity and Respect. Jimmy's newest release, Recalibrate the Culture, is already a top-selling book on Amazon. Jimmy is the owner and CEO of J. Casas & Associates, where he serves as a professional leadership coach for school leaders across the country. In January 2020, Jimmy launched Connect Ed, a publishing company aimed at giving back to the profession by supporting educators to become published authors. We'll be looking at your book, Calibrate the Culture, Our Work, Our Why, Our Values today, Jimmy. Um, so thanks for joining me and say hi to everyone. Hey, Steve. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. And I'm really looking forward to this. So very, very grateful. I'm glad that you're here. And uh, uh, before we talk about anything else, I got to ask you this. Uh, what makes you laugh or take a look at the world differently? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, what makes me laugh? Honestly, uh, well, obviously, when you surround yourself with a lot of people, um, I tend to find humor in a lot of things. And part of that is I love surrounding myself with people who do make me laugh. So uh, sometimes I feel like I can be a little witty myself, sometimes wittier than other times. But I do think that we do take ourselves too serious sometimes, Steve. And so I think it's really important that we sometimes have to find the joy or in this case, maybe find the humor in what's going on. So we don't take ourselves too seriously, but for the most part, absolutely surround myself with people who make me laugh. And it's really important. And my, uh, my three kids be in three of those, by the way, just in case you're wondering. <laughs> nice. I like that. That's, that's cool. I appreciate you sharing that. I mean, sometimes we just get a little too, uh, like you said, uh, um, a little bit too wrapped up in everything that's going on. And I think it's important that we uh, find those ways. So cool. Thanks for sharing uh, what makes you laugh. And now today we're going to be talking about school culture. You've written and spoken about, about this. Uh, before we go any further, one of the things I got to ask you is tell us what you mean when you say or hear the word school culture, what are you talking about? What are you thinking about? Yeah. Uh, Steve, the first thing that comes to my mind immediately, and this is how I define culture is simply how are people behaving in the organization. And to me, culture is all about behavior because those behaviors really are our values. So when you look at the values of organizations, it really is saying, this is how we're going to behave. I mean, there are belief statements, uh, there are mission statements and vision statements. But the question is, how are we going to behave in order to achieve that mission and fulfill that vision, right? And that's kind of how I see it. So, you know, we can talk all day about, you know, cultures of excellence. And I always say, but I want to see it. I want to walk into a building and I want to see excellence. And to me, it's always about the way people are behaving in the organization. So if we're going to put up words on our walls that say kindness and excellence and inclusion and a bazillion other words that we use, well, we're going to lose credibility if our behavior doesn't reflect those words on the wall or else they'll just become words about words. So 
as we all know, that the worst behavior that we tolerate or allow in our culture, well, to me, that defines our true culture. So simply put, behavior. Awesome. Uh, and I just want to, um, listeners, keep that in mind as we're talking, because uh, um, this is this is what we're talking about today, is that school culture and so forth. So uh, our, our focus is on your recent book, Recalibrate the Culture, Our Work, Our our why, our values. In this book, you introduce us to the four premises of culturizing a positive school culture. What do you mean? Yeah. Yeah, Steve, you know, these are the things, you know, when you first go into the profession, you're not exactly sure, right? Like, you know, I always tell people, like, someone handed me the set of keys at 26 and gave me the keys to a building. Can you believe that? To be a principal. <laughs> That's awesome. That's crazy if you think about it, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but one of the things you eventually figure out, in my case, with the help of a lot of people who invested a lot of time in me, and quite frankly, it shouldn't take 12 years for me to figure this out, right? But it did. And, uh, and one of those things was, is I never really looked at school leadership from a systemic approach. Like I, I'm being honest. I literally would walk into a school every day and I want to be a servant leader. I want to take care of people. I want to fix all the problems. I want to run around and just say, what do you need? What can I do for you? Cause that's what I thought effective leaders did to be honest with you. Well, the problem with that eventually is it's number one, it's, it's not healthy and because it's not sustainable. And the problem with that is you're really not doing what I now see leadership is supposed to do. And that is truly, it's about developing more leaders, right? And how I phrase it is really inspiring people to be more and do more than they ever thought possible. I mean, that truly is my why. It's been my why for like the last 18 years now, but it wasn't always that way. It was literally to walk in and manage the school instead of lead the school. And so what we eventually figure out is that When we talk about recalibrate, one of the things I started seeing, especially during the pandemic, was realizing that people really needed a framework from which to operate from. In other words, think about it. As we're going through this, there's a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear, a lot of worry. People are hesitating. Quite frankly, people are losing confidence. They're not exactly sure what to do. And what I always say is because they don't know where to draw from. Where are they drawing this Um, these responses. In other words, they see something, where does it come from? How do they know how to respond to that situation? Because remember, if we're talking about culture, we're talking about behavior. Well, then that means my behavior influences the culture of the organization. So that means how I respond to certain situations impacts that, right? How I initiate things impacts that. How I roll out an initiative impacts that. How I hire somebody, how I have a difficult conversation with somebody, how I evaluate somebody. These are all about behaviors And if we don't see it that way, then it's probably going to create some sort of what I call undercurrent for us, which means it's going to cause an issue that's going to hurt our culture, hurt our morale, right? And so one of the things I began to understand is, well, how can I help people? People at this time, Steve, honestly, were coming back to and saying, Jimmy, I love Culturize. We use Culturize. Oh, my God, it was our book study. We use it. We believe in it. We love the principles. Can you write another version that comes back and gives us a little bit of more of the how-to? I mean, you do a good job, but... We feel like there's still more, right, that we don't quite understand. And I started really reflecting on that. And I knew right away, well, I don't want to write Culturize too, but I do want Culturize to be a part of that. And as I began to reflect on that, I realized, well, you know what I'm seeing is that it's almost like we just need to hit the reset button. It's like we need a, a, a do-over. We need to start over, right? Like have, we need a mulligan. Nobody knew what the hell to do during COVID. But wouldn't it be nice that people gave us a mulligan for that? Well, then that's when I kind of came up with the idea of, well, just kind of like what we do with a lot of the technology that we have. What if we just, what if we just slowed down? What if we took time to actually recalibrate? And so that's where it all began for me. And then I started creating a framework to help people work through these issues that quite frankly, were just coming at us. And so recalibrate is a framework, Steve. It's a framework to help leaders understand how our behavior impacts the culture of the organization. And this is the hard part, right? And I just try to be really honest about this is what took me a long time to learn, Steve, 12 years, to be honest with you, was that I was always the undercurrent. I just didn't know it. In other words, I was the one creating the issues. I didn't see it, didn't try to, didn't want to, had no idea I was doing that until someone helped me see it differently. And so over the years, I've learned different ways of doing things. So I just put it into a framework to make it clear to people If you do these four things, I promise you, it won't fix all your problems, but it will get you a better result because it's all about changing you. It's not about changing other people. 
It's a framework, recalibrate is a framework to help us bring the best versions of ourselves to not only work every day, but home every night. And that's why I wrote kind of recalibrate. I like that. That's, you know, it's uh, when we, I was, I was someone who as a high school principal, I, I marked myself as someone who changed the environment. All right. So when they hired me, they were asking to, now, if I had this to do all over again and already knew what I experienced, I'd probably still do it, but be a little less naive. <laughs> and, you know, and part of that was that, uh, a lot of times when they hire somebody who's got that focus, um, they really, they think that they want bull in China shop or something like that, but they probably want you to tiptoe through the tulips. And if that makes any sense. And, uh, you know, it, it's kind of an interesting aspect of, uh, of talking so uh, and trying to work with people as you go in and you start uh, trying to, to bring people together to work on uh, you know, determining what they're going to work on and determining what needs to be done and stuff like this. And, and, I, and I just love this idea of, uh, you know, taking a look at our own behaviors and going back and then refocusing and, and you know, I guess uh, asking for a do-over, like you said, a mulligan. I, I like that. I like that term. That's good. <laughs> so cool. So, it, uh, you know, when, it, when, when you were working on this book, I, I just got to ask this, is there anything that was just kind of something that just kind of popped out at you that definitely had to be in that book? Yeah, definitely. You know, obviously writing a book is, is, is not an easy task, right? It's usually a grind. And I'll be honest, I don't even enjoy the process, to be honest with you, Steve. I mean, I'm just being honest about that. I hate writing. <laughs> People are like, what? You've written nine books. I know. And I hated it. Well, you've written nine uh, books that are easy to read too. And I appreciate it. So it's, they're good to read. Now. Uh, thank the stuff is there. But Kudos I will tell you me. this, when I finished them, it was an overwhelming feeling of pride, right? Nice. And I think that's part of the lesson, right? And I share this in Culturize. It's part of the reason I write is to never allow me to forget and to serve as a reminder what our kids experience every day in school when they don't have confidence in their writing. So how can I say, Hey buddy, you can do this. It's not, you need to learn how to do this. It's not as bad as you think. It's important that you know, really, well, Jimmy, you don't even do it. Right? Nice. So who are you to tell this kid that, but by creating that experience for myself and put myself in that situation, it allows me to have a little bit more empathy of what our kids are dealing with. So that's the first thing I would say, but, um, but yeah, when I'm finished, it's, it's a great feeling. And so, but as far as the book, what, what number one, I do, I do know this because it's my core, right? Those four core values of culturize had to be in there. Right. Um, and they will be in everything I do. They're in every presentation. They're in every workshop. I just finished a workshop on hiring those four core principles because it's the foundation, because it's all about how I'm going to behave. Right. If, nice. if those are my core principles about behavior, well then how do I leave them out? Right. It's no, it always goes back to that foundation. Now, can you adjust them? Can they change over time because of the influences and because of the learnings that you learn over time? Absolutely. You know, that's why I tell people your core can shift, your core can change by the influences and the, and the knowledge and the experiences that you have that allow you to say, Hey, yeah, well, I'm always growing. I'm always evolving. What, you think I was going to be the exact same person as I was at 26? No, of course not. I'm 56 years old. 30 years later, I better be different, right? <laughs> or something's not right. Now, are there some things that are still foundational that I still feel that work over those times? Absolutely. So definitely those four core values. Um, definitely the idea of protocols, frameworks, processes. I wanted to write a book that was more systemic right? That was my growth. I wanted to really approach it from, Hey, Jimmy, this is awesome. But how would you do that across the board? You know, the bottom line is, you know, I would finish a workshop, I'd finish a presentation and teachers would come up and say, Jimmy, I get it. I'm all, I, I agree with you, but how do I get my principal to do these things? Right. And then I would talk to the principals and like, Jimmy, we get it. How do we get our teachers to do this thing? Right. Then the superintendents would come, Jimmy, this is awesome. How can I get this in my buildings? All my buildings to do this. Right. <laughs> so to me, that's all systemic work. Right. So recalibrate really is a book about a systemic approach to recalibrating the entire system. Because as I talk about in the book, it's almost, and I recognize this, especially during, you know, what we were dealing with in this country was it was like we were in a systemic trauma. Everybody was hesitating. I mean, not the type of trauma, Steve, that we typically think of. I'm not talking about that. Not the horrific type of trauma that people are triggered because it brings back some life experience that they had is just so horrific. I'm not talking about that. You know, I would never be that insensitive. I'm talking about the type of trauma 
in a system where people are hesitating, where people are losing confidence, where people are no longer connecting. They feel isolated. They feel lost. They don't believe they can do this job. They're, they doubt the work that they're doing. They're asking themselves, is it even worth it? That's the type of trauma I'm talking about. And it's systemic, which means it was happening at the classroom level from teachers. It was happening at the building level from building administrators. And it was happening at this uh, district office from not just superintendents, but HR directors and business managers. So it's like everybody's traumatized. And so what I want to help people understand is, yeah, but listen, we've got to look at the behaviors at all those levels, those three levels. If we're going to actually impact the system, influence the system, change the system, then we have to do that at every level because these are systemic issues. So we have to understand, and I believe this, and not necessarily everybody will agree with me, but I believe it's always about leadership, Steve. I believe almost every issue is a leadership issue. But most leaders look on the perimeter, what I call it. They go to the perimeter, and they begin to blame kids, and they begin to blame teachers, and they begin to blame families, parents, right? Well, it's because we're on the perimeter. And the problem with being on the perimeter, as long as I stay on the perimeter, here's the downside. That means I'm never getting better. I don't have to get better. I'm not the problem. They're the problem. Well, then how do we ever grow if we're always pointing the finger, if we're always on the perimeter? So I'm a believer that we go back to our internal leadership. And it's just like a classroom. When a principal walks in the classroom, they'll see a teacher who blames a student because the teacher's on the perimeter too. They're blaming the kid, but it's really a teacher issue. And so if we're all on the perimeter, then we're all part of the systemic trauma. So how do we get back and, and create healthier processes and create a system where everybody understands we're all responsible for the culture and climate of our campuses, people? You cannot put that on one superintendent. You cannot put that on one building principal. And principal shouldn't be putting that on a teacher. We should be all owning that culture. We're all responsible for the morale, the culture, the climate of our organizations. And because it's systemic. And so we have to be able to see that. I love that. That's, uh, you know, because uh, too often it's so, um, you know, it's, we get too caught up in this thing that you're referring to as the perimeter. We hang out on out there and blame everything. You know, one does, one does go back and say, it's not my fault. It's that. You know, it's or it's that yeah. or it's that you know and that and that's so right on the money because it's like uh once you get caught up in that land um you know you don't really <laughs> you know now you're i, I don't think you're ever gonna you, you got to be careful that you kind of not mired in that quicksand of all that type of stuff because if you stay there then nothing happens for the for the better and honestly steve i i have no problem telling people for my first 12 years i spent a lot of time on the perimeter and I think that's part of the reason why I had so many issues, right? In leadership, right? Because I, I just lived on the perimeter. If when you live on those edges, that means I'm never getting better. I'm just making the same mistakes over and over and over and over, but I don't see it. And and by the way, I didn't try to, I just didn't see it. I didn't understand it. I didn't even know what I was doing. Hell, I was just doing the best I could. Remember, I already told you, they just handed me the keys. Right. And that's part of our, that's part of our problem, right? We're giving people a lot of responsibility, but not the supports that they need, not just at the building level, but let's be honest, we're doing the same thing to superintendents. And quite frankly, we're doing the same thing to teachers every day, right? Yeah, what well, these are these are professionals. They went to school. They're adults. They should know how to do it. No, they don't. Because if they knew how to do it, they would do it. Nobody wakes up wanting to say, you know what? I think I just want to suck at my job today, Steve. Nobody's doing that. Nobody's doing that. You got that right. That's, you know, it's. Uh, I think it's funny because there's yeah. so many aspects to what we do in education that is literally. Um, okay, you see that pool of alligators? Well, I'm about to throw you into it. So get ready to swim and. And it's, you know, and I, and I don't mean, I mean that literally, obviously, but it feels like it because, you know, it, all you got to do is ask somebody, do you remember the first time that you, you had a, uh, a conversation that needed to take place and you're meeting with somebody who's angry at you? And did you ever have somebody teach you how to do, you know, start that conversation or, or what not to do at least, or something like this? And the answer to that is, yeah, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, Boy, I think you got me thinking about all kinds of stuff where you're like, yeah, remember those, <laughs> as, as you're, you're going, yeah, I didn't have a class on that. And don't think they ever could have made a class on that or something. <laughs> Just got to figure it yeah, out. Yeah. What class did you take to taught you how to implement effective change? Nope. Didn't happen. Nope. How about that class on hiring? What was that class called? Nope. Didn't happen. <laughs> I love that. No. Yeah. How, did you have that. How about that conversation with that uh, teacher? No. Oh, by the way, she's a union member. Absolutely not. Oh, and her relative is on the board. No. Nope. Nice. Then how do I have that conversation? You know what happens? I don't have the conversation. I avoid it. That's what I do. Right. Because I don't know how to have it. And by the way, maybe I tried to have it. And you know what happened? I got beat up really bad for it. Gossip. I got called into the office. 
I was told to back off. The teacher went around and destroyed my character, whatever it is. And then what do we do? We pull back and then we just don't do anything. And what we don't see at the time, talk about the undercurrents, we actually hurt our culture because we don't address the issue because our best teachers are frustrated that we're not doing anything about these behaviors. Here we go again, the behaviors, which impacts our culture. That's the real truth. Oh, that's so, so important right there that you're talking about. I mean, that, that could literally be a, you know, how football teams put the sign as they're leaving the locker room that they tap. <laughs> that needs to be a sign as you're leaving yeah. your office that you tap and go, take care of stuff, take care of business, address the conversation, do whatever, but uh, don't avoid it. Uh, yeah. Oh boy, you got that right. I, I, I would want to put a, I didn't, but if I had to put any sign above my door, it would be don't do not allow average to become the standard. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Yeah, that's cool. That's uh, um, I like that quite a bit. Uh, it, you know, one of the things I wanted to get you to mention, because you, you talked about it just a second ago, which is that, you know, one thing you had to include in this book were your, your culturized principles the and the premises and the, and the first one inside the first one, it says never quit on a student. And I was just wondering if you could take right. a minute to talk about that and we could kind of take that into what, when we talk about recalibrate. And that comes honestly, Steve, and that these are the experiences that we have at some point in our life, right? And I believe that's where people need to really reflect on where are you drawing this from, right? To me, it's those experiences. And so to me, it's for me, it's going back to my own uh, child experience, childhood experience in terms of my, my experiences in school, right? The reality is I did have a lot of people that quit on me. I did. But again, I don't begrudge these people. I mean, I know I was tough to deal with in school. I was... You know, I did have a chip on my shoulder. I was disrespectful. I was difficult. I didn't do my work, right? So again, I am not being critical of our teachers. You know, they they did the best they knew how, right? They, they did the best they knew how. But the takeaway from is what happens when you have an experience when you push an adult away as a child and that adult just will not quit on you. They just will not quit. It's like you met your challenge, right? You can swear at them. You can kick them. You can talk about them. You can tell them to get out of your face. You can say the nastiest things, but they just never go away. You know why? Because they truly are champions for kids. And that's what my experience was. And so that first core value is actually dedicated to my assistant principal, Mr. Kelly Morgan, who I gave every reason to quit on me, and he never would. So that's where that core experience comes from. That's why I define it. Do not ever quit on a kid because are we really going to quit on 13 and 14 year old kids and label them for the rest of their lives that this is who they'll be for the rest of their lives? Do you know that I was expelled from school, Steve? Can you imagine at the age of 19 being a complete mess and then at the age of 26 being a principal? That is seven years removed. Do you know after I called my parents, I called Mr. Morgan to say, hey, just so you know, we're colleagues now. And you know what his response was? That's it. Oh, blank. <laughs> nice. Congratulations, son. I love you, right? Can you see it? Oh, that's awesome. That's a core value. So we have to understand, because it's one thing to have a core value, Steve, but we have to be really clear in defining to people, what does that mean to be a champion for kids? And more importantly, are we actually living that core value or do we just say that core value? Because we see core values all the time that people are not living them. And most importantly, so how do we respond to those people who do not live that core value? What are we going to do with those individuals? Right? We're just going to let them continue to behave and quit on kids and label kids. Is that what we're going to do? Because that sounds like a leadership issue to me, not a teacher issue. I'm very, very... Um, I give our teachers a lot of grace. I do. But I also give our leaders a lot of grace because I know how difficult those jobs are because I did them both. And that's why I do not judge people. I think people do the best they can. But if we don't spend more time in this country, in this world today, Stephen, teaching our people, we're all in trouble. Because that's the problem I see. We do not have systems in place how to continually grow and develop and teach our people. I believe that we have to enter schools every day. Every one of us, I don't care what your role is, with the heart of a teacher but it has to come from those core values. So we have to be clear. How are we going to behave in this school, people? Right? How are we going to behave? Because if we don't have that, we're never going to achieve the vision we have for this school. 
we're never going to achieve it because we're not on the same page of how we're going to behave. You have to behave a certain way to achieve a goal or to achieve a vision. If you don't have everybody on the same page behaving that way, never going to happen. But if we don't think that way, if you don't see that, then we're in trouble. And so that's the issue that I see that constantly comes up and it rears its ugly head because we're all on the perimeter trying to blame somebody instead of saying, no, look, uh -uh, we haven't come to some agreements about how we're going to behave because the, the healthiest cultures have figured that out. And that's why you have some organizations that are amazing. But if you understand why they're amazing, it's because not only do they have a vision, not only are they all aligned, they have values of how they're going to behave in their organization. And they all behave that way. And when they don't, we pick them up and remind them, mm -mm, we're not going to allow this. We are not doing this. And we then begin to understand why do people behave the way they behave. So anyway, those are my thoughts on it. Oh, I love it. That's that's, and it's so important to to hear that because it's like uh, you know, too often as as adults we get caught up in that. Uh, I think totally forgetting what we're there for, and so I mean, just getting back to that value of uh, you know, don't never quit on a student because you know, like you said, thirteen, fourteen. I don't care. The nineteen. I mean, there that some you know, there's a reason usually why they're acting the way they're acting if they put you to that's that right. point. <laughs> And, uh, and, and we talk about that in Recalibrate too, right? The power of why. Why do people behave the way they behave? And the quitting on kids, it's one thing to have the values, Steve, and I didn't say this, but it's also understanding is, okay, I need to be clear on what the values are, and I need to define them. But most importantly, I need to lead from those values. That's why I ask principles every day. I just ask principles today. So where is that coming from? Where are you leading that from? Where is that coming from, right? You have to see that, right? Because here, listen, if you have a teacher who comes to you and says, Jimmy, I... What do you want me to do? I mean, this kid comes in every day, puts his head on the desk, refuses to do any work. I can't teach a kid who doesn't try. You see what happened? They're on the perimeter, right? Oh, yeah. They're quitting on the kid. That's what they're doing. They're quitting on the kid. And I give them permission. See, that's what people understand. The value gives you permission. The pushback I get, Steve, I'm just being really honest. People will see that and say, oh, well, you know, Jimmy just, he doesn't want to hold anybody accountable. You know, kids can do whatever the hell they want, I guess. they. I guess we're just going to champion for them. They never get in trouble. No, that's not what it means. In fact, I'm a, you know, I'm a pretty high disciplinarian. I have very high expectations about the behavior of kids and adults. But what I'm saying to it is I don't take it personally. When a kid doesn't do what I want him to do, I don't sit there and label him and take it personally. You know what I think? My first question is I ask myself this. Well, I wonder why he's putting his head on the desk. And I wonder why he won't do any work. See, I, because I have that core value, I can draw from that. And it slows me down. It keeps me from judging. Because core principle number four reminds me what? Be a merchant of hope. Don't be labeling kids, Jimmy. Invest more time, core principle number one says, to understand why that child behaves the way they behave. I'm not asking you to be a magician. I'm not asking you to fix this kid. What I'm asking you to do is not quit on him. Why do you take that so personally? Why can't you just say, hey, buddy, you doing okay? It's all right. Hey, listen, I'm not mad at you. Hey, listen, but you need to understand something, buddy. You can be mad at me. You can yell at me. And remember, where's this coming from? Mr. Morgan. Because that's what he did to me. That's so awesome. He would say to me, he'd actually call me Mr. Cost. Mr. Cost, listen to me. You can yell at me. You can scream at me. I'm not going away, buddy. I'm still going to be here tomorrow. <laughs> I'm still going to be here tomorrow. But I'll tell you this. I'm never going to lower my standards, my friend. Yes, I do have expectations. And I'm not going to allow you to continue to behave that way. So go ahead and swear away but I'm still going to be here tomorrow. And that sucker did that for me. And that's, and honestly, in my head at that time, think about this, a 17 year old kid in his head, or Steve going back and forth saying, Oh, I hate you, Mr. Morgan. At the same time in his own immature head, trying to process this saying, Mr. Morgan, please don't quit on me. Please don't quit on me. Oh, I hate you. Please don't quit on me. Please don't get, Oh, get away from me. Oh God. Can't you see I'm hurting? Can't you see I'm messed up? Can't you see? I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Can't you see? I don't want to be here. See, that's what's happening to our most challenging kids. It's like World War III going in their head. Every kid wants to be great. They do. No kid wants to. I know some kids will fool us. But I'm <laughs> telling you, that's just where they landed. And you know what they're really doing, Steve? They're testing us. Really? You care about me? F you. You still care about me? See? Wait a second. I thought you loved me. I thought you weren't going to. Quit on me. Oh, you know what? You Oh, I see. You mean I have to comply. That's what you really are saying. No, I'm saying whether you comply or not, I'm still going to love you, buddy. Because <laughs> I'm sincere when I say I love you. That means I love you unconditionally. 
And that's, in my opinion, if we could just all begin to see it that way and then begin to behave that way, I believe most of our problems would go away. I really do. Love that. I, you know, it's, it's funny because uh, a lot of times teachers and administrators say things, they mean well, but they say things like, uh, yeah, I care about you. I, you know, if I, you know, let me know if I can help you or something. Like but then their actions prove the opposite of that. That you know, they're the first one out the door, or they're you know, they're never they're n- never at anything. Or like when the they t- tend to hand the kid off to somebody else. Because I was going to say one of the things that uh, goes with that are not just the kids who are fighting World War Three in their head, but it's also the kids who are like, yeah, fine, okay. So and what they do is they just shut down. And so then what they do is they, they don't get in trouble in the class until things are due, <laughs> you know, yeah. and they give up. Yeah. yeah they give, give up. So, yeah. And that's why it's important those, those core values, because remember core value number two of culturalized reminds me, well, don't ask others to do what you're not willing to do yourself, Jimmy. All right. So again, from a leadership perspective, if I'm going to ask that teacher to invest time in that child, to understand why they behave the way they behave and not quit on that kid. Right. Well, why do we have so many administrators quitting on teachers then? Sounds like one hypocritical, right? Yeah. And if you don't have a core value to which to draw from that, that will happen, right? You know why? Because we're human, because we have feelings, because we get frustrated. And when we're in on those moments, that's where what things where we get sloppy. That's why things get messy. Because we have no place to draw from. I'm telling the teachers to do that, but I don't do that for the teacher. I mean, every every workshop I do on principles, I ask him right now, think of the teacher you brought, you think should have retired five years ago, right? They all have them. Oh, yes. But what they don't see is they're on the perimeter blaming the teacher. But what they don't want to look at is, well, how did this teacher even get there? Yeah. And what part did you play? Right. You see it? And so that's why we have to champion for our teachers no different than we're asking our teachers to champion for our kids. We're going to expect excellence core value number uh, two, right, which is model the behaviors you want to see replicated. John Wooden said the greatest leadership tool we have is our own personal example. Well, good. Well, then show me. Don't tell me. Show me. So it's, that's why the, when you asked me what was the most important thing is those core values are the most important things, because that's what influences my behavior as a father, as a husband, as a son, as a friend, as a colleague, as a boss. I mean, I got to draw from somewhere. I'm going to get frustrated too, because I'm human. It's not, and it's not perfect, Steve. I mean, this doesn't just eliminate everything. It doesn't have to, but it allows me to remember. It allows me to become a better version of myself. That's it. I'm never going to be a perfect version of myself. That doesn't exist but I can't become a better version of myself. So. Yeah. That, it's so powerful what you're talking about. Cause just looking at what we're, what we're doing and what we're saying and, and uh, what the kids are seeing. Uh, I mean, you just got me thinking about a million things with, when it, when it goes here, because it's so easy for us to want to find something to blame instead of trying to just deal with part of the situation. And I, and I love the thought about, I mean, if we, if we all keep that part, that idea, because I, I'm a, I have a firm belief that, you know, every kid at least should have one teacher that is kind of that person who understands them. Or, you know, and they, it may not be that it's not that they're not giving up, but it's just that they understand them. So they work with them or they do something. And the kid actually likes going to that class, even if it's just to go, you know, hang out there and not get in trouble during lunchtime or something. You know, it's like, but it, it, it's so, it's so important that, uh, we um, understand uh, what you're talking about. I, I just love it. It just all comes together really well in, in your book, um, Recalibrate. You know, one of the things that you mentioned in Recalibrate is you talk about the four most powerful words in leadership. And I was wondering if you would talk about that. Yeah. It's all part of the overall premise of Culturize, right? Of course, there are four major premises that come from culturized that I wasn't, and quite frankly, I didn't do a very good job of making that very clear, which is why I came back and wanted to really clarify that and recalibrate because there were premises, but I got so focused on the four core values that I kind of lost the focus on the premises, but I want to come back and wrap that up all together. But culturized is about having a vision, right? What is the vision? I mean, that's what I ask principals today. What is it you hope the school to become? That's what a vision is. And then what, what are the values that are going to drive that? But here's the thing. When you bring a group of people together, it's powerful, right? To me, it is about it because it's about influence. It's about influencing an organization, the people in that organization. So imagine this. You bring a group of people together and you share a vision. What is your vision, right? And then I always say, then you use the four most powerful words in leadership. 
I need your help. And the reason that's important is because one of the biggest issues and mistakes that I see leaders make, which by the way, was the same mistake I made, is I thought I could lead the school by myself. In fact, I thought I was supposed to lead the school by myself. In fact, let's just be really honest, Steve. I had all the confidence in my little egotistical 26-year-old thought I could lead the school by myself. <laughs> and you know what? I thought I could do it better than everybody else. And you know what? Sometimes, Steve, I didn't even want to explain it to you, Steve, because by the time I explained it to you, hell, I could have already got it done. <laughs> See, that's the nonsense. We get fall in the traps of these traps that we fall into. So it is about changing that, but I needed a framework to do that. So I created a four-step framework that says, I need your help. So what is that about? Well, it's about bringing this uh, group of people together and it's about a process. And what is the most important component of a process, in my opinion, is you give people voice. See, when I give people a voice and I say something like, hey, listen, if we were gonna do this, if I implemented this new initiative, what undercurrents would this create for us? In other words, help me see what I don't see. What issues is this gonna create? And when I give people a voice like that and they are allowed to help me see that, that means I'm now allowing them to help me lead the school more effectively. And they will always get a better result. And that's why we do it. It's about putting a process in place where people have a voice to help us identify and most importantly, avoid those undercurrents because those undercurrents are exhausting. And this is why people are overwhelmed. And this is why people are burned out. And this is why people are leaving the profession. But what they do not see is that they are creating their own undercurrents because they don't have effective processes in place. Let's be honest, every principal that I talk to knows exactly which undercurrents central office is creating. They all do, you know why? Because they love to complain to me about those things. In other words, they see them, but you know who doesn't see them? Central office. But isn't it interesting that principals love to complain about central office? But then I've got to remind the the principals, remember that systemic I was telling you about earlier that we're all responsible for the culture and climate? Hey, principals, I appreciate you sharing that with me, but let me ask you a question. Do you think if I went and asked your teachers, do you think they know what undercurrents you're creating? Yes, they do. You know why? Because they like to complain about you too, right? Hey, that's okay, principals. I'm not judging you. Hey, teachers, by the way, I know you love to point the finger at your principals because you think your principals have to blame for everything as a one person can run an entire school. And by the way, how is your fourth principal in six years really working out for you? Yeah, because that's a really healthy culture, by the way. Let's just keep blaming the principal. And by the way, you already know they don't know what they're doing. They handed them the keys, but you will not give them any grace for that. And by the way, what are you doing to help them be better? And by the way, teachers, I bet if I interviewed your kids, they could tell me what undercurrents you're creating in the classroom. You know, there are some kids who do not like you. See it? See? Why can't we just all own our own average? We're all responsible for the culture and climate. We all do things that hurt our culture. We're all the undercurrent. But how do we create a culture of permission, Steve, where we build enough trust because we invest in people and we give them a voice and we build a relationship and we love on them and we remind them, hey, I know you want to be great. Don't worry. I'm not mad at you. I'm never going to judge you. I don't I won't get defensive. How do we create that culture where everybody wants everybody in the organization to be great? And so, yeah, I've never met a principal who was great unless every teacher wanted him to be great. You want to be a great principal? then every teacher just needs that principal to want to be great. You want a great superintendent? Then every principal in that district should say, you know what, we are all going to ensure that our superintendent is great. And when we get to that level, you will have a great culture and you will have a great system and you will have your student achievement scores rise and you will have less issues and you'll have less violence and you'll have it because we cannot understand that this is not as difficult as we make it. But it's all about leadership. And that's why leadership is the most important thing, in my opinion, if we're ever gonna get ourselves, every issue that we have in this country right now can go back to poor leadership. You know, it's, uh, it, this is so powerful. This is, you got me thinking about all kinds of things. I'm getting so, jacked up, Steve. You are just getting me all <laughs> fired up, buddy. That's all right, I gotta tell you. Oh, you back, sitting down here in Alabama, ready a little <laughs> podcast, and you got me all jacked up now, but that's nice. okay. Hey, for my list stuff is important it is the most important thing leadership is the most important component of any culture but remember everybody has the capacity to lead when i say leader i didn't say principal i said leadership that means all of us because we're all leaders and we all have that capacity but how are we intentionally growing that leadership how are we developing that leadership 
What are we doing to encourage that leadership? What are we doing to invite that leadership? What, how are we modeling that leadership? How are we inspiring that leadership? So you just got to see it differently. Because when we see it differently, then we got to behave differently. Oh, you got that right. That's this is this is awesome. The f- uh, first time I heard you speak, you were talking about uh, one of your books, earlier books, and uh, um, and I kept ha- I had kept having this in my thoughts. I I was a uh, recent director then, my mm-hmm. in the beginning of my um, this time frame. And for those of you who don't know, it's a service agency that supports school systems. And uh, Georgia, in Georgia. Yes, exactly. And uh, um, but I I heard you speak, and I and it was funny because I was thinking, and especially like right now, because now this is a f- few years later, and uh, you got a lot of other stuff behind you under your belt and so forth. And um, you know that day uh, you you inspired everybody. All right, so they're all thinking, just put me back in the school. All right, just <laughs> um, those who weren't, because it's a, pretty much an audience of of superintendents and uh, and there are principals there too, and all kinds of stuff. Well, if you were just talking to an audience of principals, like, like mid July or like right around, you know, the early July where after they leave you, they still have time to think before the whole, every faculty members back at the school and stuff like this about how they're going to do the school. What's what need something you'd want them to remember as they walk out the door after they heard you speak, um, talking to them about getting ready to make sure they look at with their culture when they get back. Slow down. Slow down, right? Most of our issues is because we're going too quickly. We're just moving too quickly because we feel the pressure to move quickly. We got a lot of things to do. People are coming at us. We got to slow down, number one. Number two, you got to be really intentional. Everything you do is about intentionality, right? Everything cannot be the priority, but you need to figure out what is the priority, right? But you need to be really intentional in your relationships, especially because it is still about connecting with people. It's still about the foundations of trust and relationships because that's the only way you can really move an organization, especially an organization that has experienced a lot of trauma. And where does that trauma come from? About the way people have been treated in that organization. That's where the trauma comes from. Okay. So those are the first two things I would say. Three, quit trying to fix all the problems. You cannot fix all the problems. It's not even your job to fix all the problems. Your job is to bring a better version of you to the situation so you get a better result. See, don't you already feel better? Get all that weight off your shoulders. You can't carry all this burden. It is not your job to fix all the problem. You are not a magician. You are not God. Bring a better version of you. But in order to do that, that means you're going to have to change you, which is why I say great change begins with self-change. Get off the perimeter, focus on you, and you become what I would call more compassionate, more empathetic. See it differently. Change you. See what you're bringing to the situation. Slow down and ask yourself, what did I do or say to contribute to this issue? It's not everybody else. It's you. And so those are very simple things that are very fundamental in my core that I try to catch myself because I know when I do these things, I get better results. But again, I can move too fast sometimes too, right? Because I'm a fixer by nature, Steve. I really am. I really am. But I know when I do that, it gets me poor results. And I do not like that. You know, I always say a poor process is a magnet for poor results. That's because your process is ineffective. And the last thing I'd probably say is, I believe you really got to spend some time in reflection. You really do. It's the only way you can get better. You got to go back and reassess every situation, think through it. And of course, lastly, give yourself some grace, people. Look, why are you beating yourselves up so bad? All you have to do is own it and go back and commit to trying to do better and be better. This is what this is all about, right? You're not perfect. You're never going to be. But you got to understand why did this happen? It's because probably because you didn't slow down. Probably because you made some assumptions. Probably because you moved too quickly. Probably because you weren't intentional. There's a reason. But get off the perimeter and understand what you contributed to that situation. That's what I would say. Awesome. I love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. I, all right. So I, I'm going to kind of go off the beaten path here just for a second. I, you know, one of the things that uh, I'm a subscriber to your podcast, it's called the interview chair. Um, who's your target audience. And one of the things I love is that you refer to when you're first sitting that sitting in that chair. So you got to talk about that. How about it? <laughs> yeah, that comes from, honestly, Steve, that comes from because, um, you know, I told you I was a principal at 26 and I was 12 years into the profession. So in a career, I was 22 years. All right. But at 12 years, I was just tired. I was frustrated. I was exhausted. I was certainly on the perimeter. 
And honestly, I just, I was done. I just, I just want to quit. I just, I wanted to go do something else because I was frustrated because I couldn't understand Steve. How can people work in a school and you do not love kids? I, I just, I could not get past that. Right. I thought I could. And I thought eventually I'd work my way through it, but I just couldn't. And it just began to eat at me and eat at me. And he, but people need to understand why is because when your own personal experience in school as a student was not good and adults are treating children like this, it is literally triggering me. I, I'm getting upset. I mean, I, I literally want to go after these teachers. I, I'm literally saying, you know what? I will do whatever it takes to run them out of the building because they are not good for kids. And I justify that in my head. But what I don't realize is how many undercurrents I'm creating for myself while I'm doing this, right? Again, I'm the undercurrent. I'm not blaming teachers. I'm blaming me for this. I want to be really clear on that. I just didn't know any better. And so the point of this is, is that I lost my way. And thankfully, I had people in my life, all older, all wiser, all people who had been a part of my life early on in my career, including my first boss who gave me a job. And they had a little intervention for Jimmy, Steve, to be honest with you. And you know why? Because they loved me and because they cared about me and they didn't want to see me leave the profession. I was not in a good place. And I literally went back to the you know Milwaukee where I started my career. I was living in Iowa at the time. And and they had a little intervention for me in a little, well, I shouldn't say a little, it was in a hotel lobby down in downtown Milwaukee. And I remember going there and I was, I was literally a broken man. I really was. And um, my boss looked at me or my first boss looked at me who gave me my first job. He said, son, listen to me. What happened to the young man who sat in that interview chair in the inner cities of Milwaukee public schools and promised me he was going to change the world? Where did that man go? And the truth of the matter is, I lost my way. I became a shell of myself. I was no longer that same person. I, of course, I was hardened. I was hard. You know why? Because you get beat up in this job. And you become hard sometimes because you have to to survive, right? That's what, that's what people do not understand. And so we've got to understand that how are we going to help these people? So that interview chair is to remind people, because when I sat in that interview chair in downtown Milwaukee, Steve, that was the best version of me ever. That's why they hired me. Because they believed in me. They needed that. They wanted that. They finally said, yes, we have some hope. And so that was the best version of me. And then I realized, well, crap, isn't that the best version of all of us? Isn't that who we really want to be? Yes. And I believe that's who everybody is. But what happens, they have these experiences. And over time, they begin to become someone they never wanted to become. We lose our way. And so what I believe is, is if we can take people back to the interview chair well, we can help them find their way back because I believe that's what the best leaders do. That's my why. Inspire people to be more and do more than they ever thought possible. And if you can do that, then you'll always be a believer because I've done it. And that's why I'll never, ever believe or ever not believe that you cannot help people find their way back. And that's just how I see it. Ah, oh, God, that's so powerful. I'm, I'm getting goosebumps right now. And, that, that, and the show's just like that. You talk about, you refer to uh, people thinking about uh, going back to that time when you're sat, sitting in that, that interview chair and uh, um, trying to get someone to believe in you because you believe that you could change the world. And I love that. Good stuff. And thanks for sharing your story. That's uh, very powerful in itself. Well, that's, a tribute. that's a tribute to my first boss. In other words. See, how I, everything I do is a tribute to somebody. You know why? It's a reminder that we're all where we're at because someone helped us get there, right? Love Nobody it. does this by ourselves. So why do I try to go be a principal myself? Couldn't I just see that? No, nope, <laughs> didn't see it. See that? Nice. It's, that's why I say I think we make this way harder than it has to be. Look, nobody's, you're not where you're at in that chair, dude, by yourself. People help you get there. Oh, yeah. And so why can't? Keep doing that why do we have to just pretend it's just it's you know if we just figure that out but some people do and i think that's why they're that's why they're calmer that's why they're healthier that's why they're not stressed out that's why you see these people like they got it all together some do some don't right but those who do is because they have figured out hey all i know is i got to work on me that's all i can do so focus cool. on me so so cool, so awesome. I, um, good stuff. I and, it, and so you know, listeners, you got to make sure you go to his podcast. Got to become a subscriber. Every time you'll get uh, some goosebumps, learn some stuff, and think about yourself. So good things. Uh, it, one other thing, Jimmy, I want to I want to mention is that you have a publishing company that has a unique focus. It's called Connect Ed. Uh, what's its purpose? And tell us about it. What's so unique about it? 
Yeah, you know how you're always trying to, you know, you have these dreams and visions. And again, this came during uh, the pandemic, too, because um, at the time, my partner and I, Jeff Zoll, were running some conferences called What Great Educators Do Differently. And because of COVID, we had to cancel all those conferences, right? And so now we're in limbo. What are we going to do? Of course, I still have my own company. I'm doing my speaking, presenting, and coaching, and all those kinds of things uh, through my side of the company. But we decided to make a shift at that time and said, hey, you know, one thing we've always talked about is, We've always talked about helping people publish books, right? I mean, look what it did for us, right? Somebody took a chance on us. Dave Burgess took a chance on me, Steve, you know, and I've never forgotten that and thought, well, how can we do that? How can we pay that forward? Wouldn't that be cool to do that? So we started a publishing company and um, yeah, and it's been, it's been awesome. And again, it's about the idea of when someone holds that book in their hand for the very first time, oh my God, it's such an amazing feeling. And I love being a part of those feelings. And so nothing jacks me up more than making other people's dreams come true, right? And so, yeah. So I feel like we're a little bit different. I think we're our, our publishing company, what separates us? Because I do think we're about excellence. I think all the people in our company, whether it's our editor, whether it's our marketer, whether it's our formatter, whether it's our person who's responsible for our book sales, whether it's our person who does, you know, whatever their role is in the company, I think if you ask the people who have published a book, I think they would tell you that our customer service and the way we take care of our authors and by the way, the way we take care of our clients who purchase these things, I think they would tell you that our customer service is excellent. I really do. And if not, I would be disappointed and I would work to do everything to make that better because we cannot be a company about excellence and then not model and live that every day. And that's what I think separates us is I want to bring value to people during that process. And so, yeah, I think, yeah, I think we're, I think we're pretty excellent. At least that's what people tell us. So. Very cool. That's awesome. I, you know, we're, we're about to wrap up, Jimmy. And, and if someone wanted to follow up and connect with you and or learn more, where would you send them? Yeah, I'll always start right at the website. Easiest way, because you can, there's a phone number on there. There's an email on there. So just go to jimmycostas.com. Best place to start. If you want to look at, you know, our books and our resources, go to connected.org. That's connected with two Ds.org. Uh, but of course, you can find me on social media too. And my do my two go to tools are definitely Twitter and Instagram. So just send me either follow me or send me a message or DM me. And of course, you can always find me on Facebook as well. So, yeah, it's pretty easy. In this day and age, it shouldn't be too hard, right? Google Jimmy Costas and or JimmyCostas.com and poof, there you go. Awesome. And I'll make sure that's in my show notes so it's easy for them to click right there and go find you. So uh, uh, last two questions are just questions I like to ask my guests and goes like this. How do you keep going when so much is going on that you may want to quit? Yeah, uh, here's a couple ways I see it. Isn't it interesting? So here's what I'm going to say. And again, not everybody agrees with me and not everybody even likes it when I say this, right? But I do believe we're all responsible for our own morale. I'm going to own my morale. And again, I think if people really reflected on and got off the perimeter and quite try to blame why, try to quit blaming everybody for all the problems and just say, you know what? I'm not going to allow people to live rent free in my head. I'm responsible for my own morale. So if that is true, if you believe that, well, then we got to do something to sometimes lift our morale. Because again, we're all going to go through those periods, those trials and tribulations where we're struggling a little bit, right? Okay. So here's the difference. I do not wait, Steve, for people to come fill my cup. I fill my own cup. And you know how I do that? I do something kind for somebody. I go out of my way to invest time or do something nice, or I do something. I give people my time, or I do something that I know that when I do it, it will bring joy to them. And you know what else I learned? It brings joy to me. I fill my own cup. I don't wait for people to fill my cup for me because I'm responsible for my morale. So I'm gonna go do something about it because every day I get to choose and I'm gonna choose that I do not want to be on the edge of the couch because I just told you I was there. And by the way, that is not a good place to be. And I'm telling you, I am never going back there again, Steve. I'm never going back again. Oh, I love that, that is so, so powerful. Uh, so Jimmy, do you have a teacher in your past who made a difference in your life? If so, who was it? And what would you say if given the chance to say thank you. Yeah, Steve, as we talked about already, right, we all have those people in our lives, right? And I think I already shared that with you. But if I'm being really honest, yeah, I probably started kindergarten with Mrs. Francis, first grade with Mrs. Othmer, second grade with Mrs. Springman, fifth grade with Mrs. Carey. And, and honestly, middle school was a little bit of a blur. It was a struggle for me, Steve. And, and so there isn't really a lot there that I look back and say, oh, they were the biggest difference. There were certainly people who cared about me and tried to help me. There's no doubt about that. 
but there were, truly was no bigger champion for me than Mr. Morgan, my high school assistant principal, who I truly dedicated that book to. And if you're asking me what I would say to them, I would say this. I've already said it to them. They already know what they meant for me. They already know. You know, I had an opportunity to go back and actually speak at the retirement for three of those elementary teachers. And, nice. oh, my God, it, it was awesome. Mr. Morgan continues to be a good friend of my life today, and he really does. In fact, um, I'm going to say maybe about four or five months ago now, he was just over at my parents' house. We invited him over. He came over for dinner, um, you know. It was just awesome. And to continue to have that relationship with them and continue to remind him how important he was to me and, and to be able to write that book and then go have lunch with them and, and give him the copy and thank him and dedicate it to him. It was, well, you can imagine. I mean, you know, there certainly weren't any dries that day, right? So anyway, it's a reminder to all of us that we're all here because someone helped us get here. And that's probably the biggest thing I want to remind people is you're never alone. You don't have to do this job by yourself and you shouldn't try Remember, the four most powerful words in leadership are, I need your help. And so I would simply say this, my friends, it is definitely, definitely time to recalibrate. Awesome. Uh, Jimmy, thanks so much for talking with me. Your book, Recalibrate the Culture, Our Work, Our Why, Our Values, is awesome. Every principal or aspiring school and school system leader should read your books. Wishing you success in everything you do. Thank you, Steve. Truly grateful for the opportunity, my friend. Thank you. Hey, you have been listening to Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12, a podcast to help you help kids achieve their dreams. Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 is a member of the podcast network based in Canada called Voice Ed Radio. Voice Ed Radio, your voice is right here. The opinions expressed on Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 are those of the guests and hosts. Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 is intended to share ideas, advice, and suggestions. Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 is produced for educational purposes. Hey, thanks for listening. It would be awesome if you visited my website at stephenmaletto.com and connected with me, left a review, and listened to more episodes. And by the way, you could also share it with your friends, with your family, and uh, your colleagues. Thanks so much. You're awesome.